Conductors in electrostatic equilibrium going to be the topic of this lesson in my new general physics playlist, which when complete will cover a full year of university algebra-based physics. Now we're going to talk about what it means for a conductor to be in electrostatic equilibrium and then go through the four rules and explain uh, kind of what's behind each of these four rules for conductors in electrostatic equilibrium. My name is Chad and welcome to Chad's Prep where my goal is to take the stress out of learning science. Now, if you're new to the channel, we've got comprehensive playlists for general chemistry, organic chemistry, general physics, and high school chemistry. And on chadsprep.com, you'll find premium master courses for the same that include study guides and a ton of practice. You'll also find comprehensive prep courses for the DAT, the MCAT, and the OAT. So let's start this lesson off by reminding ourselves of what a conductor is. And simply put, a conductor is a material that allows charge to move around freely throughout the substance. And a good example is a metal. Uh, we now understand that it is the electrons that have the potential of moving throughout the surface, not the protons, which are kind of trapped in the nucleus of each atom. All right, now for a conductor to be in electrostatic equilibrium, what it means is that even though in principle charges can move throughout it, so that it's reached this point of equilibrium where the charges are no longer moving throughout it. So the, there are four rules governing uh, a conductor that's in electrostatic equilibrium. And let's take a look at those rules and we'll go back and explain each of them uh, after we have. So first rule is that the electric field is zero everywhere inside uh, an isolated conductor. And isolated just means it's not grounded. If it had a, a source of electrons either to or from it, because it's connected to the ground, then this would not apply. Second rule is excess charges uh, all reside on the surface of the conductor. Third rule is electric field lines are going to be perpendicular to the surface, so coming off that conductor. And then finally, the fourth rule is that if you have an irregularly shaped conductor, so then you're going to get greater charge density at sharp points. So where there's a, a smaller radius of curvature, you're going to have the pooling up of the excess charges at, that point, at those points in the surface. So now we're going to go back through and explain why each of these four rules is true, uh, but the truth is we're not really going to explain why they're true for most of them. We're going to explain why they cannot not be true, kind of a double negative situation. So first rule says uh, the electric field is zero everywhere inside an isolated conductor, and we're going to consider a solid conducting sphere. So and let's say again we've got an excess negative charge here on this solid conducting sphere, and so there's excess negative charges, you know, throughout the, the, the conducting sphere. So, and it's reached, if it's reached this state of, you know, electrostatic equilibrium, that would mean that none of these charges are going to move anymore. And the problem is, is that if there's an electric field anywhere inside here, well, these electrons would want to move. And so as a result then, to be in electrostatic equilibrium, there can't be an electric field anywhere inside it, or some of those mobile charges would be moving. So that's kind of the idea. Rather than proving that it's true, we're proving that it can't not be true, so to speak. All right, the second rule says that excess charges are on the surface. So in this case, this would not be an example uh, of a solid that's reached electrostatic equilibrium because if you've got excess mobile charges, then they wanna move as far away as, part as possible in a conductor, they can move apart. So in this case, what we're gonna end up with is them moving farther apart until all the excess charge just remains on the surface, and now they're as far apart as possible. And so we brought this one up kind of earlier in an earlier lesson in the chapter. So, but uh, there's your explanation of it. So the third one here, electric field lines are perpendicular to the surface. So let's draw those uh, electric field lines. In this case, with an excess negative charge, that means the electric field lines are gonna terminate on the negative charges. So in, in drawing them in, I'm drawing it perpendicular at every point along the surface. Now, why do those have to be perpendicular at every point along the surface? Well, keep in mind, if the electric field points in, that means the, the negative charges actually wanna move in the opposite direction. So don't forget the Coulombic force experienced by a negative charge is in the opposite direction of the electric field. So even though the electric field points in, the electron's actually experiencing repulsion and wants to move out. All right, now it's perfectly perpendicular. And what that means is that there is no component of this electric field so that is gonna be parallel to the surface. So, and, it, and there can't be. So if we, let's take for consideration, let's say that instead of being perfectly perpendicular, let's kind of put it off at a slant like this. Well, all of a sudden now, what that means is that there's a component that's gonna be perfect, perfectly perpendicular, but there's also gonna be a component now that is parallel to the surface. So, and if there's a, per, uh, 
a component that's parallel to the surface, that means there is a propensity for this uh, excess electron here to want to move along the surface. Now it would actually again move in the opposite direction, which is confusing, I know. Um, but again, the columbic force for a negative charge is in the opposite direction as the electric field. So, but it would want to move along the surface now. And so there can't be any components of the electric field that's parallel to the surface. And the only way there's no components parallel to the surface is if the electric field really is perpendicular to the surface at all points. And so once again, we're not proving uh, that electric field lines have to be perpendicular. We're just proving that they can't not be per perpendicular, so to speak. So, but perpendicular to the surface at all points. All right, so now we move on to the last one here, and this is gonna be the, the biggest pain in the butt to explain here. So, but greater charge density is gonna be at the sharp points, the, uh, the points with the uh, smallest radius of curvature, if you will, if you have an irregularly shaped conductor. And so let's draw an irregularly shaped conductor. So here we've got a rather large radius of curvature, and here we've got a rather small radius of curvature. And rule number four is saying that we're going to see greater charge density, uh, pooling up of the charges, the excess charges over at this end, as compared to this end over here for a second. All right, so uh, this is not the easiest one to explain. And what I'm going to do is pause it starting in a situation where we are not in equilibrium, and then say, okay, then what does it look like when we start getting closer to equilibrium? And so on this, where we got this large radius of curvature, I'm going to put two negative charges fairly close together near the surface. And over here, I'm gonna put two negative charges fairly close together, about the same distance apart. So maybe a little closer from the, the way I've drawn. I will just draw these a little bit closer, make it a little easier. So, and then kind of say what would need to happen for this to reach electrostatic equilibrium. All right, so instead of drawing the electric field now, I'm gonna draw the direction of the Coulombic repulsion between these negative charges. So I'm gonna uh, use a different color if that helps. But I'm not drawing electric field now, I'm drawing the, the direction of the Coulombic repulsive force between these electrons. And so in this case, they want to move farther apart here, and in this case, they want to move farther apart here. Okay, now keep in mind, when this thing reaches electrostatic equilibrium, where are these electrons going to want to move? Well, again, they're all going to be near the surface, and they're all gonna to wanna to move in a direction perpendicular to the surface. Again, if the electric field points perpendicular in towards the surface, that means the electrons wanna move directly out uh, perpendicularly from the surface. So keep in mind, that's where they eventually wanna to get to a point where, where that's the case. All right, so these electrons here, most of that force that they feel is gonna push them along the surface uh, and they're gonna to wanna to get farther and farther apart. Okay, so whereas here, now all of a sudden, we see that, you know, with the, the small radius of curvature, instead of that uh, force they feel being directed mostly along the, uh, a direction parallel to the surface, they actually have a pretty significant portion that's actually already perpendicular to the surface. And so we know they want to stay on the surface, but which of these electrons is going to have a greater propensity to want to move farther apart as they move along the surface? Well, the ones that have more of the force directed along the surface. And so in reaching equilibrium, these guys are gonna end up moving farther apart than say these guys instead, just based on where those force vectors point. Again, we know they have to, if they're gonna move, they have to move along the surface. According to rule number two, that's where the electrons need to be is on that surface. And here, almost all of that force vector points along the surface, and they're gonna feel the greatest force to move apart along that surface as compared to here. And so as a result, in the end, you're gonna end up with a pooling of charges, uh, charges that end up in the end closer together when you have the small radius of curvature than at the large end over here. And again, not the easiest thing to explain, but uh, for me, kind of the best explanation, if you just start with a, a situation where they're not in equilibrium, and then say, as they try to move towards equilibrium, what it looks like, and here these charges are gonna move farther apart at, where there's this area uh, with a larger radius of curvature than the one where they're at the smaller radius of curvature. All right, so there's our four rules for conductors in electrostatic equilibrium. Let's do one example problem to go with it. So this next question involves the two conductors in the diagram here. We have a solid conducting sphere at the center, and then we have a hollow spherical shell, if you will, uh, around it. And the question says, if the charge on the solid conducting sphere at the center of the diagram is positive 4.0 nanocoulombs and the total charge on the hollow conducting outer sphere is positive 7.0 nanocoulombs, then what are the charges on the inner and outer surfaces of the hollow sphere? And so what we've got here, 
So we got a net positive charge on that sphere right there, and those charges are gonna, and again, the excess charge is gonna wanna reside on the surface. Well, because there's an excess positive charge on the outer surface of that solid center sphere, we're gonna get an excess balancing negative charge. So on the inner portion uh, uh, of the hollow outer sphere to kind of balance that out. Again, these charges are free to move throughout a conductor. And in this case, that means that they wanna spread out to the outer surface, but in response then, so the electrons in this uh, wanna kind of move towards the inner surface, being attracted to those positive charges and, uh, and responding to the electric field created by them. Well, in such a case then, we know we have a net positive charge on this outer sphere, and if we have a net negative charge of the flow of electrons on the inner surface, that's gonna leave behind a net positive charge on the outer surface as well. And the question is, what is the charge on the inner surface? What is the charge on the outer surface? Or at least that's the first two questions. Well, in this case, the charge on the inner surface is, they're moving in sense, simply to balance out the charge they're responding to at the center. And it turns out it's gonna be exactly the same charge. And so in this case, if there's a positive four nanocoulomb charge at the center here, then on the inner surface, it's gonna be balanced out perfectly by a negative 4.0 nanocoulomb charge as well. Now here's the deal. Uh, we still have conservation of charge taking a, uh, place here. These two conducting surfaces are not in contact, so there's no transfer of charge. So if we started off with seven nanocoulombs uh, of positive charge total on this uh, outer uh, hollow sphere, there's still seven nanocoulombs total of charge on it. And the charge is either gonna be on the inner surface or the outer surface, it's always going to be on the surface again, according to rule number two. If there's negative four nanocoulombs on the inner surface and the total charge is still a total of seven nanocoulombs, well then there must be 11 nanocoulombs of charge on the outer surface. That way the positive 11 on the outer surface and the negative four on the inner surface still adds up to a total of seven nanocoulombs. All right, now the next two questions are, uh, that are involved here are not calculations. They're just gonna make sure you remember something about the rules here we just learned. And so uh, the next part of this question says, what is the magnitude of the electric field inside the center sphere at equilibrium. Well, again, at equilibrium, everywhere inside an isolated conductor, so at equilibrium, the electric field is zero. And so anywhere inside this sphere, the electric field is going to be zero. And the second question, very similar, says, what is the magnitude of the electric field inside the hollow outer sphere? And this is gonna be a little bit confusing. What do we mean by inside the hollow outer sphere? Because you'd be like, well, this thing's inside the hollow outer sphere. That's not what I meant, so I kind of refined it in parentheses here, and I said, again, what is the magnitude of the electric field inside the hollow outer sphere? And in parentheses it says, in between the inner and outer surface. So when I say inside, inside the conducting surface itself, if you will, uh, at equilibrium. And once again, if we're in a conductor at equilibrium, then everywhere inside the conducting material itself, the electric field is once again zero. So no calculation for the last two parts of the question, it just, uh, making sure you remember what rule number one is for a conductor and electrostatic equilibrium. If you found this lesson helpful, consider giving it a like. Happy studying.